Hi there, I'm Keaton. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way that you can do that is by texting River Connect. That's one word to the number 97,000. You can also head to our website, theriverchurch.cc, to learn more about us in upcoming events. Lastly, if you want to give to the River Church, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321 or head to our website and click the Give tab. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Well, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Man, well, my name is Zach Hannan, and I'm the student director here at the River Church Davison, and I'm also a student at the River Church Pastors Academy. It is such a blessing to be able to be here with you this morning. And before I go any further, I just wanted to say it's been such a blessing over the past couple months to be able to be here every Wednesday night with your students and have the opportunity to be the student director here. It's been such a blessing, and I can truly say Davison is my home location. I feel so welcome and loved. I appreciate your support, and I appreciate your prayers for our youth. It's incredible to see what God's doing there. But without any further talk, I'd like to go to God's Word today. So let's go ahead, turn our Bibles to Matthew 27, 51. And if you're here this morning and you don't have a Bible, I'd like to recommend you download a Bible app. The River Church has a Bible app feature available on there, but also the Life Bible app is a great option as well. But we would like you to see God's Word for yourself. It will also be available on the screens behind me. But again, Matthew 27, we're actually going to start in verse 45 so that we can have some context for our passage this morning. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And another one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it to a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to him and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Verse 51, and behold, the curtain of the temple tore in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks split. And with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for guiding us to church this morning, Lord. Whatever the reason is that we're here, Lord, I pray that we would hear from you. I pray that your word would speak and that we would understand and perceive what you have for us this morning, God. I ask that whatever circumstances, whatever situation that we have at home that may keep our attention from your word would be removed and that we'd leave all of the baggage at the door and we'd come to you with open hearts and open minds, God. I thank you for the opportunity, and I pray for your guidance. In your Holy Son's name, amen. Over the past couple weeks, we have been looking at different miracles that we see at the cross as we continue our series, Miracles at the Cross. In week one, we looked at the darkness that lasted for a span of three hours. Night, or day, literally became night. And last week, we looked at the veil being torn at the temple from top to bottom. And today, we will be looking at our third miracle, the earthquake. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't been with us so far, if you haven't heard the past sermons, please go back to the River Church app or online on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. We have it available on there for you to listen to. It has been a wonderful series, and I encourage us to have full context for what we listen to. So feel free to catch up on there. But today we'll be talking about the earthquake at the cross. And before we get into that, I want to give us a little bit of context for what has been happening. If you haven't grown up in church, we see Jesus was betrayed the night before by Judas Iscariot. He was betrayed and sold to the religious leaders for 30 pieces of silver. He was beaten, he was put on trial, accused falsely, and condemned falsely. He was whipped, he was bruised, and beaten beyond recognition. And he was marched out of the city to the place known as Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there he was put on a cross, a wooden beam. He had nails between each wrist and foot hanging on the cross, struggling to breathe every moment. And above his head was a mocking sign that said, here lies the king of the Jews. And throughout the crucifixion, throughout this time, many people would say many things, would mock him and try to torment him with their words. It was a brutalizing experience, and it was done to a man who didn't deserve it, for he was perfect. 
So during this event, we see several miracles, as I've mentioned, the darkness and the temple with the curtain being torn. But today we're talking about the earthquake. And at the moment of Jesus' death, we see a devastating earthquake hit Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And this brings us to the question of why the earthquake and what was the significance? What is the purpose? Why is this included in Matthew's gospel? Why are we paying attention to it? And to understand that, the significance of the earthquake, I believe we first need to understand the significance of the audience. There were people there that were standing around the cross watching this whole time. At the cross, there was a mixture of a few of Jesus' followers who stayed hidden and were at the cross, but there was also his enemies. You see, there was the Roman soldiers who were carrying out the execution, and there was the religious leaders who had put him on trial falsely and were mocking Jesus. We have both Jew and Gentile, Jew and Greek, Jew and Roman. See, the Jewish people had a full understanding of Scripture, of prophecies, of the Messiah in biblical history. The Romans didn't have that. They only could see what was happening around them and base their belief on that. So I think it's important for us to keep an open mind that there is a mixture within this audience, but mainly it was people who wanted Jesus to die and were mocking him. So what is the significance of the earthquake for the Jews that were in the audience? And to understand that, I think we have to grasp what's going on in the mind of the Jews with this earthquake. We have to look at biblical history. We have to go to the Old Testament. We have to see the earthquakes in the Old Testament that God has used for his glory in the past. So go ahead, take your Bibles and go to Exodus 19. We'll be in Exodus 19, 16 through 19. In this passage, God is establishing his people. He had just brought them out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery and suffering, and he has led them to Mount Sinai. A cloud by day and a fire by night has led them to this place, and God is about to give his law and his covenant to his people. So again, Exodus 19, 16 through 19. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud tempet, or trumpet blast so that the people and the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp and met to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke to God and answered him, and God answered him in thunder. In this passage, we see the power of God on display for all the people to see. This wasn't just a small ragtag group of Israelites. This was millions of people witnessing this event all at once. It was incredible. But the question is, why is God doing this? What is God trying to accomplish? And if we look back at verse 9, God gives us the reason for the thunder, the earthquake, and the power that he's demonstrating. So looking at verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. God is using the power to shake the earth, the, the mountain on flames. He's using it to validate the message he's giving to Moses. He's using it to validate his law that he is giving to Moses. God is using his power, his authority, to leave the people with no doubt that God has given them this law, that God has given them this covenant. And furthermore, God affirmed his law by speaking the Ten Commandments to the people directly. And we see the response of Israel in chapter 20, 18 through 19. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpets and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. The Jewish mind during this earthquake at the cross may have gone back to what they had read in Exodus about the earthquake at the mountain, about God giving the law. You see, Jesus also received a verbal affirmation from God within his ministry. Jesus had miracles done throughout his entire ministry to affirm his message of repentance and belief. And we see in Matthew 3.17, God says, Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. 
So we see a parallel between God speaking his law and affirming Jesus as his son and the redeemer of the law. In the Jewish mind, the earthquake could have been a confirmation of God's power, a confirmation of God's authority for the figure in question. So what are things that Jesus claimed on the cross? What are some things that he said while he was up there hanging before the earth shook? Earlier in the passage, we saw him say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's much debate on this passage. I've sat through many discussions with friends and men wiser than I talking about whether God was fully forsaken or whether this is just a figure of speech or whatnot. But I don't want to get into that debate. I don't want to talk about that. I know what is clear, that Jesus is referencing Psalm 22 on the cross. So if you want to open up to Psalm 22, we see a clear reference. And I think Jesus has something to say there. So in Psalm 22, while you're turning there, within the Jewish tradition, there was a memorization of Scripture and a memorization of psalms or songs. They would memorize these songs together. They would sing them like we did just a few moments ago. And the way they would know what song they're singing is one person would say the first verse of the song. So when Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every religious Jew in the area would have instantly thought of that song, would have instantly thought Psalm 22, and it would be playing in their head. I don't know if you've ever had a song come on, someone sings one verse, and all of a sudden it's in your head for the rest of the day. This is most likely what has happened for the Jewish religious leaders in that moment. So again, Psalm 22 opens up with the exact quote, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if we read verses 6 to 8, We see, I am a worm, not a man. I am scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Now I want to look at Matthew 27. We're going to be flipping between both. It will be on the screens behind me, but there's a connection here. Matthew 27, 43. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. We see a connection between verse 8 and a connection between the mockery that is happening in Matthew 27. And we see it again in Psalm 22, 18. We see the fulfillment of this prophecy. It says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And in Matthew 27, 35, it says, When they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them, and we're casting lots. In quoting Psalm 22, Jesus is proclaiming and highlighting the prophecy that is being fulfilled in the very moment of his death. He is bringing an explanation point to the Jewish audience saying, look at this. Look at what you're saying. Look at what is happening. It is foretold in history. This was foretold a thousand years ago in Psalm 22. By quoting this, he is claiming to be the fulfillment of this prophecy. He's claiming to be the Messiah, the fulfillment for a 1,000-year-old prophecy. And the last statement we hear Jesus make on the cross as he he breathes his last and gives up his spirit, in John 19.30 says, It is finished. And immediately, the earth quaked. And immediately we see God affirm what had happened. We see the earth lash out at the injustice of what had taken place on the cross. You see, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he, for our sake, he made him sin who knew no sin, so that we might be the righteousness of God. Jesus was blameless. He was righteous. He was holy. He was the only one that actually lived up to the standard of the law given in Exodus 19. But he had chosen to take on our sin and die on the cross to fulfill the scripture. See, in the Old Testament out Mount Sinai, God gave the law and validated it through the earthquake, through the miracles. But all the law could do was condemn. You see, people could not live to the perfection of the law, to the standard. We are to be holy as God is holy. If we look through the Ten Commandments, every single one of us in this room have fallen short of the glory of God, which is what Romans 3.23 says. It says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
And according to James, in James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point becomes guilty of all of it. But Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law on the cross. Matthew 5.17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus' death on the cross, he paid the penalty for the sins of the world. When God gave the law, there was an earthquake. And when Jesus fulfilled the law, there was a massive earthquake as well. So for the Jewish perspective, Jesus has quoted Scripture and fulfilled Scripture in that very moment. They are seeing things happen right next to them. As they hear him quote the passage, they hear their neighbor mock him in the same tone, in the same voice, in the same words. And when he gave up his spirit and died immediately, there was a massive earthquake that just shook the world. It shook the area. And for any person that was there, they could not look at Jesus on the cross and say, Oh, well, it's just a normal guy. He probably did something wrong. This is just a normal guy dying. There was too much going on at that point to believe that. You would have had to have been a fool to believe that that was just a normal man who died. You see, the only way for a person standing there to deny Jesus as Lord, to deny him as king, to deny him as the son of God, would be for their hearts to be harder than the stones that were breaking beneath them. We've seen the confirmation. We've seen confirmation after confirmation throughout what Jesus had said on the cross and what has been fulfilled by the miracles around him. But I want to pivot to the Roman soldiers. They did not know Psalm 22. They would have had no idea what he was saying. They honestly wouldn't have cared what he was saying. So what was on the minds of a non-Jew, of a pagan or a Greek? They didn't know prophecy. They didn't know Scripture. But they had eyes. They were able to see what was happening around them. And according to ancient superstitions and ancient beliefs, when the Romans, for the Romans, when they would see the sun go black for three hours, that meant something. When the earth shook at the death of a man, they had known that that had to be some sort of judgment by God or his displeasure for what was happening in that situation. At the cross, we see a total judgment of outpouring of judgment onto Christ. We see him being punished for the sins of you and I. We see God's authority over nature and even nature's response to the death of its creator. John MacArthur says, Therefore, when God shook the earth at the death of his son, he gave the world a foretaste of what he would do when one day he shakes the earth in judgment at the coming of the king of kings. That is the second coming of Christ. God used the earthquake not only to shake the earth and break the rocks, but I believe he used that earthquake to shake the hearts of the men standing there, to break the stones that they had in their heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. He gave them the ability to see God, to see Christ as he was through these miracles. And we see that in Matthew 27, 54. See, Matthew 27, 54 says, When the centurion and those who were with him kept watch over Jesus, they saw the earthquake and what had taken place. And they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Men who had no religious background with the Jews, men who had never read Psalm 22, saw the earthquake, saw what was happening at that cross, saw how Jesus died, and said, this had to be the Son of God. The men who were overseeing the death of Christ, who had hearts of stone towards him, who had nailed him to the tree through that earthquake and through the death of Jesus, had their eyes opened. You see, Ezekiel 36, 26 says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. You see, God used this earthquake, the circumstances, the situation, the things that these men saw in order to renew their hearts and minds to see the truth. And we see the same thing with the thief on the cross. 
You see, there was two thieves besides Jesus. Jesus was in the cross in the middle, and there was a thief on his right and on his left. And they were mocking and ridiculing him like the rest while dying on the cross. But there was a shift. Over the course of the hours of Jesus on the cross, one of them came to believe in him. He began to fight for Jesus and tell the other not to mock him, for they are sinners, but Jesus didn't deserve to die. And he went to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus responded in Luke 23, 43. He said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So both for the Roman centurion and the thief on the cross, we see God use crazy circumstances, painful circumstances and even dangerous circumstances through the earthquake and his own crucifixion for the thief on the cross, God used both to open their eyes to the truth. And I believe God can and does use the same things in our own lives. God will use suffering, earthquakes, and painful situations in your and I's life to grab our attention, to show us how much we need him and how weak we actually are. You see, in this room, I don't know what's going on in every single person's life. I don't know what you're going through personally. I don't know what happens at home. But I do know that it's not always sunshine and roses. And that a lot of times, there's loss, there's pain, there's suffering, there's family circumstances, and we struggle. And I don't know what you're going through, but I want to encourage you that God may be trying to get your attention through your life circumstances whether they're painful or good, God may be chasing after you. And for some of us, maybe we're running after sin and running away from God. We're not seeking him. We're actually trying to run away from church. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you've abandoned your faith. And God might be using the circumstances in your life to bring your attention to your need for him, to bring your attention that you need to go back to him. You see, in the Bible, we have the story of the prodigal son, and he goes to his father and says, give me your inheritance. I wish you were dead. Give me my money. I'm going to live my own way. And he leaves, and he lives a upscale life for a short while. Sin is good for a season, but in the end, it brings forth death and suffering. So he lives upscale, but then his money runs out, and he becomes poor, impoverished, and desperate, and he realizes his need for his father. And he eventually decides to return to his father. But the beautiful part of the story is that his father was standing at the door with arms open wide. And as soon as he saw his son, he ran after him, brought him into a hug and says, stay with me. I love you. He restores him. So if you're running away from the church, you're running away from God, you're running away from faith, I want to invite you to run back to God. He has arms open wide for you today. God is waiting for you with open arms. But if you're here and you don't know the Lord, you've never known the Lord, or you don't even know what any of this means, like the Roman centurion, you've been an enemy of God up until this point. Maybe God is trying to grab your attention today or through your life circumstances to show your need for him. And he's allowing you to go through some painful, hard, and tough situations to help you realize that he is the only one that can get you through this life, that can carry you through the day. Without God, it is impossible to please him. You can't do enough. I can't do enough. But with Christ, with Jesus, with God, all things are possible. You see, in Romans 10, 9, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with your heart, one believes and is justified. And with your mouth, one confesses and is saved. So please today, don't harden your hearts. If you don't know the Lord, if you have a heart of stone, let God give you a heart of flesh, an understanding of who he is. Take this time to realize that he loves you and he wants a relationship with you. And he didn't die on the cross for no reason. He died on the cross while we were still sinners that we might be saved. If you don't know Jesus today, please repent of your sins and believe in him today. He loves you. He cares about you and has the best for you. He wants us to believe and confess our sin, to repent, which is a change of mind, changing our love for sin for a love for God, and then believing in his ability to give us new life through his death, 
burial, and resurrection. And if that's you today, please talk to me or Pastor Justin after the gathering. We'd love to walk you through what salvation looks like. Don't leave today without having that conversation. And finally, if you're a believer this morning, if you're here this morning and you feel like the world around you is shaking and falling apart, if your life is just full of trouble and tribulation and trial and you just don't know how much more you can do, how much more suffering you can take, remember that God can use suffering for his glory and ultimately for our eternal benefit. There's a purpose behind the pain. There's a purpose behind the earthquakes. There's a purpose behind the shaking in our lives. God uses destructive and bleak situations to bring us to faith. When we go through those situations, God can use our response to the gospel as an opportunity to share the gospel with other people around us. The way we handle the earthquake will show people where our faith lies. You see, when the earth quakes and the rocks split, God is trying to grab your attention. He shakes your world, but God is reminding us that our world isn't our firm foundation. Even if everything around us is falling apart and shaking, he is our firm foundation. On Christ, we build our life, and he is the king. He is our Lord. He is our Savior, and ultimately and most importantly, he is unshakable. He is what carries us through every day, every hour, every moment. He is what carried the apostles through the suffering and trials that they went through, the martyrdom that they experienced. He is the foundation that doesn't shake and doesn't break. And we need to step out in confidence, no matter our circumstances, knowing that he has conquered death and the grave, and that one day he will return and the earth will shake again in final judgment. And because of that, we don't have to be worried. We don't have to be terrified because we have built our life on the foundation that will never be shaken because all will pass away, but he will remain. So let's live the rest of our lives in a way where we can represent the gospel in every circumstance. Whether we're at work or at church or in the world in general, let's live with Christ as our firm foundation and live with that hope for other people to see. We're always to be ready to give an account for the hope that is within us. So church, the earthquake at the cross had a purpose and a meaning and it brought people to salvation and earthquakes in our lives have purpose and meaning and they can bring us to salvation and others to salvation so let's go to the lord in prayer today do thank you for who you are thank you for the miracles that you do in our everyday lives that we don't even notice god thank you for the way you work for the way you live and the way you move in our lives god thank you for your word being living active and powerful. God, I ask that you fill in the gaps within this sermon, fill in the gaps within the message and worship within our church, God. Help people to come to know you. Work in our lives, Lord. Bring us to a true understanding of you and your word and your gospel, God. I ask that each and every one of us would live a life that is reflective of repentance, that we would always turn away from sin and turn towards you, our God. I ask that you'd carry us through the rest of the week and help us to look for gospel opportunities within the craziness within the earthquakes. In your Holy Son's name, amen.